us tonight, which is great. Um, good evening, my name is Yatsa Tepitz, I'm the Assistant Sales Specialist for Outdoor for Phillips Lighting. I've been asked to um, provide you with a bit of a spiel, I suppose, on smart lighting, uh, where we are today, and what the possibilities are for the future. I do hope that you, if you, there's something you don't understand or you want to ask a question, please ask. I'm happy to stop and answer what I know. My background is uh, I've been in the lighting industry for the last five years, five and a half years. Prior to that, um, the majority of that was actually in product development for um, indoor luminaires for architectural lighting and specifically LED. Um, I was also doing it for about two or three years in terms of outdoor lighting control for dry lighting. Uh, prior to that, I did about 16 years in the electronics semiconductor industry, uh, being a LED product specialist. Um, I did a Bachelor of Technology in Opto Electronics at Macquarie University many, many years ago before you know, moving on demand and LEDs and all that sort of stuff into fashion. So, um, <clears throat> it's, to be honest, LEDs and lighting is my passion. It's something I've always wanted to be involved in and I'm happy to be involved in it now. And I do hope I can give you some um, relatively unbiased information, but nearly all of this um, is through research uh, of my own, my experiences, and from people I've um, connected with within the industry who know probably more than me, but I'm hoping to share that with you. Um, so I think one of the statements you see is errors and omissions accepted occasionally in the bottom of documentations. Um, this is not the Bible, this is just my opinions. I'm happy to hear your opinions, and I do hope that you do give your opinions. Arguments are great as well. So, um, any questions, please, um, I'm happy to hear. Right, so with the agenda today, um, what I want to go through is talk about the terminology for outdoor lighting controls, uh, moving on to smart lighting and smart cities. Um, I want to talk about the current landscape uh, worldwide, so we get an understanding of where Australia fits. The Australian landscape, uh, what are we doing here? Uh, where are we now? So this is basically a general overview of what is currently possible with different types of technologies that you should be aware of, and also various pros and cons of these systems and uh, solutions. Where are we going? So what are the developments in terms of smart lighting, the smart cities, the internet of things, and big data? <coughs> and finally, what should we do now? Are you ready to make a move? Do we need more education and more understanding about smart lighting? And of course, finally, questions. Um, like I said, if you ask questions now, you can wait until the end. It's up to you. So outdoor lighting, control, smart lighting, and smart cities. So in the last few years, the term outdoor lighting controls, or OLC for short, has been uh, discussed when talking about street lighting control systems. I think that term is currently uh, moving to a more generic buzz phrase, and that's smart lighting. No longer are we um, just controlling the lights, but we are also making them smarter. The word control can have a, a negative effect for some people. So the marketeers worldwide have uh, coined uh, you know, a new term, which is smart lighting or smart street lighting. Um, so what that means is it's not actually pos uh, no longer possible or just possible to turn the lights on and off but you can also get really useful information from the data that these uh, street lights can provide. At the moment, we can measure voltage, current, ambient light, uh, temperature, phase, and a host of other things. We can connect to other devices, such as street lights, uh, uh, devices to the street lights, such as rain sensors, pollution sensors, noise sensors, cameras, uh, motion sensors, and pretty much anything in your imagination can come up with. So we're no longer just talking about controlling the lights. What we are, we are turning them into uh, devices that are giving us smart information and lots of data to play with. So these street lights are on, uh, like, they're basically in prime locations. They're high up on a pole, they're away from buildings, they're close to roads, they're close to where people and cars pass by, and they're the perfect place for transferring information of all kinds. Um, as a result, street lighting is the key to making a city a smart city. So the worldwide landscape. There are basically literally hundreds of cities around the world that have connected street lights. Some of the well-known players 
in the industry of a presence in many countries. For example, Philips has 261 connected cities in 30 different countries. LeafNut by Harvard has at least 51 cities connected. Talenza has over a million devices in eight countries. And Silver Springs has several hundred thousand connected streetlights. And not to mention over 2.4 million smart meters in Victoria alone. There are several smart city incentives at the moment uh, in Europe, such as Barcelona and Copenhagen. Both these cities are trialling uh, various vendors, technologies and innovations in determining what works best for both the public and the private sectors. The Copenhagen Initiative is called the Copenhagen Solutions Lab, and that includes the Copenhagen Street Lab. Barcelona is touted as the first smart city in the world, testing innovations in e-health, open data, electric vehicles, citywide Wi-Fi and a multitude of other smart city solutions. Let's move on to the Australian landscape. The picture up there says that's pretty cool here. As you all see, this is the city of Brisbane at night with these wonderful HPS lights. I don't know if you uh, don't want to be laughed. Anyway, the Australian landscape. So there's roughly a total of between 1,200 and 1,500 connected street lights or smart lighting solutions. That's it. That's all we've got in Australia. Compare that to the worldwide landscape. We are way behind. Now the majority of these are uh, small scale pilots or protocol, uh, small scale projects or pilot projects. Um, so there's a, you know, several dozen of these. Um, there's no major lighting, uh, connected lighting projects yet. I say yet because I do hope that we see this in the near future. We do have multiple vendors available currently in Australia who serve the Australian market. Some of these which I've already mentioned are Philips, Telenza, Silver Spring Networks, Telematics Wireless, LeafNut, Dimonoff, Echelon and Lumino IQ. And there are even some large multinationals such as Cisco and uh, local telcos such as Telstra who are getting involved in smart lighting and smart cities. Pilots are happening right now um, across the eastern seaboard, Canberra, Melbourne, Hobart, Adelaide and Perth. However, there doesn't seem to be a clear unified focus on smart lighting and smart cities in Australia. Up until recently, when the federal government released their smart cities plan, each state within Australia seemed to do their own thing. From my experience, South Australia and Canberra took the lead in pilots or smart lighting trials, um, trialling various technologies. Queensland focused on smart cities concepts, so they seem to jump over that smart lighting hurdle. Um, Melbourne was a combination of both. However, Victoria did move forward several years ago with their 2.4 million devices for the smart meters. And Sydney has basically been pretty generally slow on the take up with only a few small trials. An example is uh, the city of Sydney spent a lot of money um, changing over about 8,000 of their streetlights to LED. Unfortunately, none of those streetlights are controlled through it, which is a real problem because streetlights are generally made to last for 20 years. So does that mean we're not going to change it for 20 years and Sydney's not going to have a connected future? I don't know. Hopefully they'll find some money somewhere to change it. Um, so there's been... Check what else I've got there. So there are a various uh, number of tenders that we're currently asking for lighting solutions. Unfortunately, it was always as an option. It's always as an afterthought. So some of these include, uh, and this is all public knowledge, knowledge here, so I'm not giving away any information. Um, the expressions of interest last year for smart lighting, such as Canberra for 77,000 pieces, Vic Roads for 14,000 pieces, Melbourne City for 12,000 pieces. And I suppose the critical thing is I'm not sure if these will go ahead um, or if they're just going to be an option. So I do hope, fingers crossed, that something will happen there because as soon as these large changes do move forward, we may start seeing other people follow suit. Australia has always been known as a country of technological expertise. We've always been very good at innovation and what we do, but no one's ever wanted to fork out the money. It seems like China was always the one who had the money and stole our ideas. But um, I think it's something that we really need to start looking at. So where are we now? For smart lighting, there are two key components. 
there's hardware and software. And in terms of hardware, there are three main technologies, Powerline, Wireless, um, RF, and also cellular. I'll just quickly go through each of these, just so you understand. Um, if you find it boring, tell me and say, please move on, but hopefully you get a bit of an understanding. So Powerline. Powerline's a mature technology that's been around um, for a number of years, and it's been used in various industrial applications. It's been used in emergency lighting uh, for maybe 15 to 20 years, even in Australia, and street lighting for about five or so years. The main player in this space is Echelon, and the basic building blocks, um, there we go, but we have trouble with what I'm saying. The basic building blocks include a second controller, so that's a little grey box here. You've got an ORC, so these are the outdoor lighting controls that, fit, that are basically installed into your Luminera pole. And an RF bridge, in this case, is a bridge that connects the power line from one phase to another phase, or from one lighting circuit to another lighting circuit. The second controller is really the brains of the system. It's basically an industrial PC that can connect up to about 250 outdoor lighting controllers. The communication is done by a power cable itself and can jump across phases if the phases are close enough to one another and have a long enough run. The second controller also generally has a number of um, inputs and outputs. So in this particular case, it has two digital uh, low voltage inputs, two high voltage relay outputs, it has um, communication ports which are RS-232, RS-485 or Modbus, and also some uh, external communication to good old school RJ-11, which is the other whole um, you know, low board rate motors that extinct now, thank God, or your Ethernet via RJ-45. Um, it has the ability to add various meters, uh, a multitude of multi uh, Modbus devices. Some of the limitations of this system include the noise in the power line that may uh, come in from other factors such as uh, turbine fans you might find in tunnels or other uh, noise that you might get from substations. Um, it's also that the fact that it must be hardwired between all the outdoor lighting controllers, otherwise the RF bridge, which is wireless, is required to retransmit the power signals. Generally the hardware is quite bulky and it's not easy for retrofits, but it is possible for in-pole mounting of RLCs. It is a robust system with multiple um, worldwide vendors um, with a lot of experience. However, it is, it is also a localised network. So wireless and RF are hard. <coughs> so wireless is probably the most prominent of the technologies in the smart street lighting space. <clears throat> the basic architecture relies upon a wireless uh, or RF node, which is once again found on top of the light poles. So this is multiple names, you can call it um, a node, a light point, or an OLC. And that communicates with the central control unit. So in this case, it's a little box there, which is wireless. Wirelessly communicates. The information that is sent from the individual nodes or light points is collated at the access point that then sends the collated information via a modem to a central management system, or a CMS, you can see in the top corner here. And that is generally stored on a localised computer or server, or more commonly now, on a cloud server. Once again, I just been away for a spoke too quickly. Um, just so you know, I did this presentation the last couple of days, so I haven't had a really good chance to practice it for you. Wireless RF hardware. So I'm going to spend a bit more time on the, the RF hardware side of things and help you understand what is available in the market. Because this is where most people are headed down in terms of smart lighting. So, there are many vendors that have various solutions, um, as the list of vendors I've uh, discussed. A mesh network is generally available in the 2.4 gigahertz range, um, or alternatively in the 850 to 950 megahertz range. Um, so mesh is the ability for each light point to communicate to the access point with every other <coughs> light point um, and you can also communicate with every other light point. So this gives the benefit of uh, repeatability of a signal should one of the light points fail. Typical star point is another technology, or uh, star or point to point. Topologies are also available. In this case, I've got a picture of a Talenza system, which is uh, popular in South Australia and also in Perth. 
So the Talenza system uses a star topology which is around the 900 megahertz range and um, Telematics Wireless, which is another brand that also does a star topology, have theirs in the 420 megahertz brand, um, licensed, licensed band. So a standard rule of thumb is that these frequencies, for the frequencies, is that the higher the frequency, the shorter the range between the nodes, but the higher the data bandwidth. Now, conversely, the lower the frequency, the longer the range, but the lower the data bandwidth. So it really comes down to what you're trying to achieve with your system. So typical installations in the wireless or RF can see anywhere between 200 to 5,000 light points per access point or gateway. Um, and even for um, the star network, you can see up to 50,000 light points. So as an example, uh, Auckland has gone with the Telematics Wireless Galaxy system. It has the capability of connecting to 50,000 light points in a star topology. They've currently installed, I think, 12,000. Some people correct me if you know it better. But I think it's around 12,000 light points currently connected. Auckland, Auckland Council funded it. They did a great job. So uh, maybe you can follow the lead and do what they've done. But from what I understand, Auckland Council owns the lights. And I think that's one of the critical things here in Australia, um, specifically in New South Wales, and I think in Queensland, is that the lights are generally owned by the utilities and are paid for by the municipalities or the cities. Um, if I'm incorrect, please don't worry. There is another third, more, um, third common method for smart street lighting, and that's the use of cellular. So the cellular, the cellular node um, typically have a built-in SIM card, like your mobile phone. Um, it has a GPS uh, chipset, which allows for uh, ease of use of the installation. Um, it also doesn't re rely upon any extra bit of hardware. So what that means is, is that you don't need that access point or your gateway, and you're able to connect directly to the already established telecom network. I suppose the only caveat for this may be that if there is no telecom network, if you're at the sticks, and Telstra, Optus, Vodafone aren't interested in having any telecommunications out there, you can't use this as an option. So I think uh, Ergon Energy, who works way out west, probably won't be the option for them. They'll be going for some of the long distance stuff. Um, however, the majority of the population is where the majority of the telecoms put their uh, networks, and that's where the majority of the lights are. So, as long as there's a 3G or 4G service available, a cellular node will be available to be able to connect it directly to the cloud server for true direct end-to-end -end connectivity. <coughs> Some of the benefits can include a reduced cost in hardware due to uh, the lack of the uh, access point or gateway to the node. Um, and so, it also negates the issue of distance that is usually required from an access point. So an access point to a wireless device or a segment controller to a power line device needs to be within a certain distance. If you just want to have one cellular node connected here and another one connected five kilometers away, it's not a problem, as long as you've got network connected from the telco. So, other recent technologies. So some of the recent technologies that have been starting to make an impact into smart lighting is LoRa. Um, so LoRa stands for Long Range Wide Area Network and also another company called Sigfox which is also a similar technology. Both require a gateway and you can see that in there. So this is uh, obviously uh, pictures courtesy of those two companies. Uh, both require a gateway um, and have a different way of showing it. And they communicate with very low power devices. So as you can see here they're talking about things like bicycles. They're talking about meters, they're talking about, I don't know what that is, a tire or something. Luminaires, even animals. You can put a tag on an animal and be able to monitor it, where it's going, what it's doing, what its habitats are. So this is the benefit of a system such as LoRa and Sigfox. Um, so Sigfox, for example, has recently promoted that it's uh, set up a Sigfox network in Sydney and it's looking to expand its coverage to the majority of the population in Australia in the near future. The range is quite long, up to several tens of kilometres uh, in some cases, and works on a star topology. Generally, the amount of data is very low, so you may only communicate once a day, and you might only get 10 kilobits of data sent through. In most cases, it's one way, so it's from 
the node to the gateway. That's generally which way it goes. Um, fees are usually paid on the amount of data sent, so it can be a very low cost solution. However, if you want to analyze, if you want to interrogate the nodes more often and send more data, you'll start paying prices for it. Okay, so it's an important thing to notice. It can be a very cheap solution. Um, it's perfect for location tracking and simple data acquisition. And it's a really good entry point for the Internet of Things. So, software is the second part of any system with regards to um, smart lighting. Um, so, the CMS or uh, the central management system retrieves the data from the light points, it analyzes the data, and it represents it in a useful fashion. The key features that include, uh, include locations and type of light points, failure notifications, scheduling off, sch scheduling of, on and off times, and the ability to dim based on various schedules. Most vendors have their own special uh, features and styles of representing the information, but in general they all aim to do the same thing. The CMS can be locally hosted on a PC server, a PC or a server, or remotely hosted on the cloud server. Some programs are 100% proprietary. Some are proprietary but allow um, users to access their APIs, so their application programming interfaces, such that they can use their data in their own city managed systems that may already be established. And also, some, such as Streetlight Vision, are more open to allow for a multitude of connected variants to be able to be controlled. So if you were to go ahead, it is wise to do some investigation of what you plan to do with regards to your system, what kind of software you require, what kind of hardware you require. So it's all about bundling these things together. So what are the most common functions today with regards to street lighting? So street lights today are currently used to monitor and are based on an on-off schedule. I should have written this different city, so it's not so much of a tongue twister. Um, there are some dimming of street lights which are based on schedules, so this allows things such as energy reduction. And there's also some external triggers such as motion sensor that you can dim lights up from a lower level. So an example would be on a bike track um, or a boat ramp or even a car park, which maybe might be late at night, nobody's using it dim the lights down to conserve energy and then if somebody does enter that boat ramp for example nice and early at 4 o'clock in the morning because they want to go fishing the lights can come up, come up give them safety and security to know that they're in a well lit area so these are the kind of things that you can do um, at the moment so that was where we are now state of the nation and now where are we going what are the interesting things so as I mentioned earlier, smart street lighting is the first of the building blocks to establish a smart city. It's the backbone or the conduit for the city to add more intelligent devices and services that can help the city and its citizens in a myriad of ways. What we are seeing now is the integration of street lights with various sensors and even cameras that we have never really seen before. It will enable us to transfer and use data to be able to um, make our time in the city safer, more interesting and more inviting, and a better place to go and visit. Just going through some of these things that we're going to see. Sensors. So some examples could be a rain sensor uh, on streetlights. They can automatically change the sign to tell people to slow down. You can even have pollution sensors that can automatically change the sign to tell people to wind up their windows in their cars during a very bad pollution day, or in the event of a bushfire on a freeway. As I was flying in today, I saw all these fires <coughs> around Brisbane. I'm, I'm guessing it's back burning. I hope it's back burning, but pollution over Brisbane is terrible. So these are the kind of things that can come up and uh, advise people, you know, for your health and safety, turn your windows up, recycle your air conditioning because there's a high level of pollution in the air. Cameras. Cameras can determine if a car parking space is available. Send a message via the cloud to an application on your mobile phone that will direct you to that free spot. This is an opportunity where the data that this information gives can be sold by the cities or the councils to web app developers. And what that means is that smart lights can now become an income revenue stream. 
this is a good selling point for the councils and the municipalities who are interested in developing this. At the moment, majority of people are talking about energy savings and maintenance. You can actually start an income revenue stream from doing some smart technologies with your luminaires. GE has even used cameras in their streetlights to automatically detect if somebody has left a package in a public space. This will trigger an alarm or a warning to a local authority of a possible terrorist attack. GE has also demonstrated that using noise sensors and streetlights, they are able to triangulate the location of a gunshot. I really hope we don't have that here. Smart Pulse. Quite an interesting subject here, and there's a lot of people getting involved in it. So multifunction poles or smart poles are becoming more and more commonplace. I'm seeing them around Sydney a lot. Um, and the main use for these are for putting everything onto the one pole. You've got you know, signs saying no parking, no standing, no stopping. You've got street like, traffic lights on there. You've got Wi-Fi. You've got street lights. You've got banners. You've got plants. You've got everything. Now, cities and councils are installing these smart poles that can charge, in this case, electric vehicles. Once again, the, well, once again, this is a way of earning revenue from the people of the city. The time used to charge a vehicle, the credit card details, and the amount of energy can all be sent back by the smart node on top of the street light to the council. And the council will then charge the user's credit card for the energy used. Also, the telecommunication organisations are realising that with the increase in the number of people using mobile phones and accessing data to download movies and communicate with others, that they really do need to expand their networks. Access to tall buildings is proving to be difficult and costly, and it also makes sense to have the network transceivers closer to the users, which is nearer to the ground. There is no better place to put this network infrastructure um, other than in a smart lighting pole. Better yet, for councils and cities, if you get the telco to pay for the pole, the light, <coughs> the network, the smart lighting solution, and even the maintenance, what a, this is a great way to save some money and kick off your smart lighting program and your smart city program. Now, I don't say it's just as a thing that may happen, it has happened. It's happened in San Diego, it's happened in Los Angeles. This is a smart pole with a network installed and the telco paid for the lot. Council or municipality didn't pay a cent. This is something we really need to consider because everyone's been talking about how expensive the lighting controls is, the amount of money, all that sort of stuff. We need to think of more innovative ways. Uh, I've even had experiences with some banks, uh, ANZ Bank and Macquarie Bank, are interested in helping with money. So, banks like giving out loans, right? So, we'll see where that goes. Right, IoT and Big Data. So, this is slide 18 of 22. I haven't got too much longer to go. So, IoT and Big Data. There's a huge amount of discussion at the moment with what's happening in the Internet of Things and Big Data. At the moment, the Internet of Things in itself can take up several days of discussion as it encompasses much more than just smart lighting, and I am definitely not an IoT expert. But it can be viewed as both a subset and an overarching technology with regards to smart lighting. But IoT is all about a connected world, transferring all types of information and data to various end results. And what this means is that there are possibilities for council cities uh, to develop an income from the data connected within the city. It allows for more useful information that can be shared with the citizens and residents. For example, sharing of traffic information, bus, train, ferry, disruptions, available parking spaces, special or unscheduled events, weather updates, and even terrorist attacks. With this, it can improve the everyday life of the citizens through information sharing. And finally, by connecting cities via the Internet of Things and the transfer of big data, it's possible to make cities more beautiful and even relate to the environment or public spaces for the benefit of its residents. And just a couple of slides on the city beautification, because I do like this sort of things, and I think I'd love to see this happen more in Australia. Um, and this shows where places that uh, the IoT and smart lighting has uh, already occurred. 
And in this case, we've got the New York, or New New York Bridge in New York. Um, it's lit up, obviously, to be viewed as a work of art, but it can also change colours based on schedules or localised events. So they may have the, the 4th of July events and they can change to red, white, and blue. These are the kind of things. Um, the New York Yankees might win, so they'll change it to whatever colour the New York Yankees are blue, right? So they can do different things. <clears throat> the Avenue of the Arts in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, USA, it's actually bringing the art from inside all these artistic studios to the out by using light. Another way is casinos, bringing those punters in, choose to the bright colours. But they can also mimic what is happening around the area due to connectivity. So you might once again have an event um, uh, for certain holidays and things like that. And it can also, uh, you know, on a gloomy day, you may want to light it up, make people a bit more happy, bring out the warm colours. On a sunny day, make it cool, bring cool colours so people feel a bit cooler, not so hot. So what should we do now? Now I'd like to make this part of the forum and for us to discuss a few points and any concerns we all have. So I'll throw up a few things. If you want to have a chat, right? If you don't, that's fine. Um, so what are the barriers for smart street lighting? What, what do you see as people who are here at this place? What do you find the barriers for smart street lighting?
can find out if they failed, if they haven't failed. You know exactly how long they've been working for because it's got a nice little timer inside that tells you this has been on for 6,500 hours. You better start thinking about changing over. Be smart about the assets. The RMS in Sydney, which is the Road Maritime Services, is the RTA, um, they have 14,000 lights that they own and they maintain. I spoke to the asset manager and I said, how do you keep track of your assets? And he said, fire an Excel spreadsheet. An Excel spreadsheet, like, that's kind of crazy, right? It, for an organisation that has 14,000 of anything, just to look at it by an Excel spreadsheet where the technology there is now where you can update this information, upload it to someone's software and be able to look on the screen, even if it's not connected. At least you've got a graphical representation of where your lights are, on a map, what kind of technology it is, you can colour code it. You know, I want red for sodium and blue for mercury and green for LED. You can do all that and make it a visual representation. Um, yeah, so, you know, I can talk all day about that sort of stuff because, like I said, it's my passion. I think you've been there a lot about utility and ownership, like the lights here and the um, service screens that are around the energy. Yeah. Basically, like a community service obli um, obligation where the, the price and the charging for the electricity for the, the, for the lights and maintenance is long term in stock. And, and um, so there's no incentive, you know, they, they don't want to go spend any money on it. And uh, having introduced uh, LED lighting simply because it's been burned in the past, with, when they've had some, I think it's the late 80s, there's been some studies, turned out the premature phase. So, um, got a little note here on the side that you guys can see. Um, so, the Lighting Council of Australia uh, is hosting a Smart Street Lighting Forum tomorrow in Sydney. And the, the reason they're doing it is they want to hear what customers want, what they, why they want it, who needs to make decisions, who will pay for the infrastructure, and discussions between uh, your roads authorities, utilities, municipalities, um, and also how the regulators and the governments play a role. And the regulators come into the lever excited and discussed, which is, you know, especially the dipping, because at the moment the regulators like uh, AEMO and NMI, for example, they can say, yep, okay, we know that if you have dimming, which is the same every single night, you know, we can work that out. We can do an unneeded supply, so you'll have four hours on 100 percent 50 percent for the rest of the night. We can work this out. We know how many hours there are in the night time. But if you want to have dynamic lighting, then the only way you can do that is by having a meter supply at the front of the line. But having said that, that's fine as well, because they'll get the billing information from the meter supply as opposed to what I need to get. So that kind of stuff will be discussed tomorrow. Um, I don't know, is anyone getting down to that to Sydney tomorrow? No, okay. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> a, couple of few, a couple of stories in regards to um, my experience. One of the councils in Sydney is a council called Ride City Council. Ride City Council have come up with an ingenious... How are we going for time anyway? Do we... It's zero, two, zero, one, it's Okay, <coughs> So one of the councils um, decided that how do we get on board and not pay for stuff? So they had approved all these multi-dwelling developments around all this old industrial area Meadow Bank area, which is along the Parramatta River, which used to be big industrial areas. People were building multiple units on there. I'm talking 100 units, 150, 200 units. They went to the developers, right, you can do this, but part of your DA approval, you must 
in shore. As per all the normal things, and the roads are okay, you need to install smart street light poles, multifunction poles. You need to install LED lights, which we will tell you which ones, and you will install smart lighting controls, and we will tell you which one. And you need to pay for it. And that's what, you know, the contract, the builder has no choice. He's got to do what they say, otherwise they won't get a DA. So they spend their extra hundred grand or whatever it might be on all those poles and the controls and the lights. And then at the end of it, the council gets a DA, signs a DA off, the builders walk away. <laughs> what are they going to take the lights with them? No. The asset then becomes the council's. So now the council has a free asset that they have to maintain, sure enough, but they're happy because they've got a control system and they've got a company called UAM or UASG now, I think it is, who does their maintenance for them. And guess what? It's LED. All they have to do, hopefully, fingers crossed, is you know, every three years give it a bit of a wash and monitor it via email or via their CMS. Simple. Right? And that's what they're doing now. They're building up their smart city that way. So that's an interesting concept. Um, another example, uh, which is not the best example, I think, <laughs> um, is North Sydney Council. So North Sydney Council went ahead and put in 201 streetlights. And, and this is, I suppose this is showing how difficult it can be to try to get um, these things across. They said, yep, we want smart, we want streetlights, that can be dimmable, have a seven pin leaning base, and um, we'll worry about controls later. Why? You know, they didn't know enough about it. So once again, education plays a part. They went out to the industry, they had a look, they got all these, they went out for a tender, got all these different um, information back, came back, it was super expensive. Um, so they got other, other people involved to say, what have we done wrong? This doesn't make any sense to us. So they're trying to get more education on board um, within their council to be able to make a decision. So still they have these luminaires that have been installed in July last year and still have no controls. So they're just turning them on and off by day like by switch at the control box. So there's some horror stories and some good stories. Um, it's, it's interesting to know um, that the utilities don't really care. Um, there's no benefit to them, except I did have a chat with a guy from Ergon. Um, there's no utility there here, is it? Just checking. No. <laughs> Why would they come to the ODS? So, um, Ergon Energy, they have millions of square kilometres around the greater Queensland region with other streetlights. They spend half a million dollars on diesel every year for their crews to drive around to see if that light is working or not. They spend the same amount of money on paying people a salary. Well, it's a million bucks just for checking if a light works or doesn't work. And if it, of course if it doesn't work, change it. They want to be able to put controls in. They say, I'm happy to spend that million dollars that I'm spending on my diesel, you know, the cost of the truck and the people, to invest in a technology that will tell me if my life is on. They don't care, they don't care about turning it on or off. They just want to be able to communicate with them. I don't know, this was uh, talking to Ergon last year at the Smart Lighting Summit. So that was what, September last year? I don't know what's happened since then, if they've done anything. But Laura, for example, is a perfect opportunity for them. Because Laura is a long distance, really basic information, cheapest chips device, and put it into a luminaire, it gets sent back, back to base, wherever Ergon is, and it says, hey, I failed, come and fix me. But, Ergon being Ergon won't say, well, you know what? One out of 100,000 lights, I'm not going to fix. Two out of 100,000 lights, I'm not going to fix. Maybe I'm going to wait until I've got 20, 30, or 50 lights that need to be repaired before I'll fix it. Because it costs me a lot of money to take people out of it. So they now have the understanding of what's failed, where it's failed. They can allocate resources, they can allocate funds, all that sort of stuff. That's the benefit of these sort of systems. There's, you know, Smart, it's not all about smart cities, it's not about data sharing. There are other more realistic reasons that people want to um, do this kind of technology. Um, without any prompters, I haven't got much more to say. <laughs> um, do you have any questions? Anything else? Anything at all? If I don't know, I'll say I don't know. But if I have an answer, I'll dabble away. Pete's not here yet, so you might as well talk. Yep. Can you dance? <laughs>
I actually did about 20 years of college dancing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, just, I, mean, I want to see that. But... <laughs> um, yeah, look, I, I don't know what else to tell you, to be honest. Uh, I, don't know what else, but I, I do have one slide of questions. <laughs> yeah, so this is um, Buenos Aires. Buenos Aires. Uh, is that Argentina? Yeah. Have they got really bad issues with funding and with like going down the road and all sorts of They've spent fuckloads of money changing 90,000 streetlights, which is 70% of all their lights, to a connected LED lighting system. How the hell do they get the money? I don't know. Obviously, this picture yeah. is on the other thirty percent that hasn't been changed up because it's so good. But if you've got a keen eye like me, they're all orange. Um, yeah. So, look, there's what, what I'm saying is that there's plenty of organisations out there. There's plenty of people who I believe are members of the IES, members of the Divine Council. We've even got some people here who know about this stuff. Um, to those of you who are interested, talk to your your peers, talk to them, see what can be done. If you need them to go with you to see customers, uh, uh, councils, or whoever the people are, we'd be more than happy to. So I think this is really, you know, I'd love to see this move forward. I'd love to see the street lighting. I mean, I'm with it wherever I can at the top levels trying to get this across the board to Australia. You know, hell, even thanks, thanks to my two parts and say, how can we help? We want to get involved.
So the idea is, is that you don't need to build this. You just have to put this four poles up, which are solar powered, so it costs you nothing um, after you pull it. And they'll walk up to this thing where that magnetized line is and they'll stop. They'll realize, yeah, it doesn't feel right, I'll get back inside. This is 15 years ago. You know, the technology, the intelligence, the, all this sort of stuff is there, and it's still hard to believe. I get stories every day from my friends out of Western Australia saying that there are people who work for, you know, for main roads or um, utilities who are the engineers, um, I shouldn't say that way, who are the engineers, who are recently out of university, you know, three, four years out of university, who still don't believe that LEDs will last 50,000 hours. And so we end up, we're going to stick with our 20,000 hours. Actually, in New South Wales, 
to choose if they want to go to their dental. Um, they got paid. You know, so where you may pay $50 for a luminaire, um, a lamp change for a traditional technology, you may pay $500 for the LED option. So that's what the council needs to do in New South Wales and Valentine. Now, I am going to take care of my lighting control system for Phyllis. I said, they didn't ask for the need to the base, they didn't ask for dimmable control here, I'm going to give it to them. Because the last thing I want to do is have 20 pieces installed somewhere, and then they go, I want to control it. And they go, great, here you go, just put in this node, turn it, off you go. Okay, job done. My previous organisation where I worked at, we had a business, uh, a really good tenant of one, with uh, Western Sub. Western Sydney region, uh, regional councils, and it was for 15,000 P category LED units. That was installed last year, or in the last year. Unfortunately, because it was as per the Australian standard, um, we had to offer D2 P. So, so D2 is a little thing, so if you're familiar with it's a little startup for a few hundred dollars. There's no real uh, control system. Go into that socket, it's too small, it's in the wrong place. So, what that means is now that the greater Western Sydney of uh, uh, West, Greater Western Regional Sydney that has these 15,000 brand new LED lights can't do an easy way of changing those controls. They're stuck with these dumb LEDs for 20 years because that's what these products are designed for, and that's what they pay for. 20 years, Western Sydney's not going to have. Street lighting controls, unless somebody pays some money for it and re retrofits them or replaces them. I don't want to get to that stage where we start seeing all of Australia change over the LED and they forget about smart lighting. We need to get the message out, we need to educate people slightly. We need to tell people if you're going to go to So, you may have heard plenty of people talk about a 7 pin meter base, you know, 5 pin, 3 pin, whatever, who cares? It doesn't necessarily have to be simplified, five, it can be three pin. As long as it's a NEMA base that you can connect something to, because that way we can bring on smart cities. I think it's very important to try to get a message across. If you want to use it now, you have to use it now. If you want to use it in five years, be proactive.